Welcome back to Amani on Air. It's your girl Amani, and it's election week. <laughs> the day is finally upon us. This is actually going to be the last episode before we find out who our next president is. For this episode, I could not think of a better conversation to have than with Rania Batrice. As most of you already know, and as I've spoken about on a few of the episodes so far, in 2020, during the last election season, I actually decided to run for Congress. And Rania was like my pseudo campaign manager slash consultant slash strategist. It was my first time ever meeting slash working with her. And it was also the first time that I had heard of a Palestinian woman holding the ranks that she did within the political world. She, she came from helping to manage Bernie Sanders' campaign, and she's just such a brilliant person. So I wanted to bring her on to share some of her insights. The thing is, my decision to run for Congress was really my first foray, really genuine foray, into running for public office. And as I'll get into in my conversation with Ananya, it was one of the hardest experiences of my career so far. Being a young Muslim Middle Eastern woman in her 20s and going out into a public arena of that level was definitely terrifying for sure. And this this conversation, this episode is the first time that I'm really publicly speaking about what that experience was like. I've always wanted to talk about it, but to be honest, it really it really was pretty traumatic. And I think it took several years, aka an entire election cycle, for me to really process what that experience was like for me. Spoiler alert, I lost brutally. But the thing is, and, and I guess part of that is the reason why I never really got around to talking about it, is there was a part of it that felt embarrassing you know, and I just remember going on social media in the days after my race and just the way people from my own community were kind of like making a mockery out of my race and the way that I was being like made fun of because of how badly that I lost. It was not the best feeling, um, you know, and, and that's it comes with the territory, right? When you put yourself out there, when you are in a public light when you want to make change happen there is obviously and, and make change happen in a very public forward-facing way because there's a lot of ways that you can make change happen and they don't all look the same but when you do put yourself in that position you open yourself up to criticism for sure but also a lot of negativity um and you just have to be prepared for it and I don't think I was fully prepared for it that time, you know, like I hate to admit it because after, you know, I'm living my entire life as a Muslim girl, you would think that I had built up a thick enough skin. But, you know, that was a big shock for me was to see just how extreme American politics was or is and how exclusionary it is for the type of people that we expect and accept to see taking on leadership roles, especially as women, women of color. The story goes that I decided to run for Congress. I ran for Congress in New Jersey, my home state, where I was born and raised. Jersey girl, through and through, as you all know. <laughs> and I decided to challenge the man that was my congressman my whole life. Congressman Pallone has held on to his seat for longer than I've been alive, longer than my entire lifetime. And Rutgers University is part of our district. It just didn't feel right to me that we had somebody that is obviously extremely outdated representing such a huge, young, diverse population. And from the get-go it was really brutal you know like i remember we got word that senator cory booker's office was like who is this girl and who does she think she is and we're being like very hostile towards my race um challenging Pallone. Pallone also is like the democrat golden boy he's like besties with nancy pelosi and has millions of dollars in his war chest. You know, he has such strong, strong, strong relationships with the lobbyists 
including and especially APAC, the American Israeli Political Action Committee. And um, it was a very challenging and ambitious pursuit, to say the least. I decided to run only four months out from the election. And what triggered me to make that decision was the fact that we were dealing with a pandemic. It was in the middle of COVID and my mom got COVID and things were not looking good for my mom at that time, you know, and just seeing how much the failure of our representatives, how deep it went to be proactive and take action during the pandemic was like the final straw for me, especially seeing the way that it impacted my family and families of people that I love. So I wanted to take things into my own hands. And I decided to four months out from an election, you know, those are the kinds of races that you prepare for for years ahead of time. Um, I decided to jump in the race and people were not happy about it. You know, like there was <clears throat> there was another man there was another candidate that was challenging Pallone, and he was running on a super progressive ticket. He was supposed to be like the progressive challenger of Pallone. And um, he decided to take me to court to try to get me off the ballot. And that was um, the first time that I found myself in that situation. <laughs> So we're in court in front of a judge and I'm representing myself. Meanwhile, the other challenger had like an entire legal firm behind him and they were really coming at me to try to disqualify the signatures on my ballot petition. So basically to get on a ballot when you want to run for office, you have to petition to get on and every state kind of has different rules. But, you know, New Jersey, there's like a certain threshold, like a certain minimum number of signatures that you have to achieve from within your district that say they support your run for office. And I got all of those signatures in one weekend. And you know why? Because I hit the college town. I hit literally the young people at the most grassroots level and mostly young people from minority backgrounds and they were effing with me and so they all signed it immediately it was so easy to achieve and that was something that for my challenger again both of the men that were in the race with me were white men i was the only woman and at that a woman of color that i think is something that went over their heads and they just like cannot and that's that's what's so funny about it it's such such a huge gap with that it's like you you literally are so detached that you don't understand the power that young people and minorities hold how quick they are to mobilize when they see see something that they believe in and so i was very lucky blessed grateful that i got so much support from the jump as soon as i decided to run and also people in my hometown especially my college town know me okay like i actually did the work to build connections with my communities and to you know thankfully find that support when i needed it because of the work that i had done with them um and so they took me to court and it was honestly the most depressing thing that you could possibly see okay what they did was so maniacal they literally took my ballot petition and challenged every signature one by one and the way that they challenged it was sw under such strict scrutiny okay for example if a signature <clears throat> uh, you know they had every signature had to have like their name their signature their address um, you know, like specific details. If, for example, someone put down an address, but they left off, like they forgot to put a zip code, even if they put like their actual township and everything, they'd be like, oh, that that's a disqualifier. They would literally disqualify that name because of that. Mind you, like I said, the majority, if not the entirety of my petition were all people of color. So it really goes to show how deep the disenfranchisement goes. You have black kids, you have Asian kids, you have mixed kids, you have people that are literally the kinds of communities that are underrepresented that 
we should be making it as easy as possible for them to vote. We should make it as low a threshold as possible to get them engaged civically. And you're literally finding the mo- most minute details, the littlest things to throw the book at them to disengage them from the process. One of the things that I remember that really stung me so bad was when there were names that were duplicates, okay? And by duplicates, I mean they're different individuals, but with the same name. For example, if there's like a freaking like Juan Gonzalez, there's going to be like 10 of 10 Juan Gonzalez's. And then they'd be like, oh, well, we don't know if that's the same person or not. Even if it's like multiple different addresses, they're different individuals. You know, like taking names that are common to ethnic communities and using that as an excuse to remove them. This all actually happened in a court of law, okay? And um, I just remember also that was, they, they, they tried to run the clock out on me, right? Like we, no one had ever heard of this before. They made our trial run for over 14 hours straight, no breaks, 14 hours straight with no breaks. Like literally they don't even hold murder trials for that long. They would not let us, you know, reconvene the next day. I had made those motions multiple times. And I think they thought that because it showed like weakness that I was getting tired, they'd be like, no, like and turn it down to try to like get me to tap out basically. And I refused to do that. And then eventually the judge tapped out and was like, all right, we're going to have to reconvene the next day. And that night I decided to go on social media and make it clear to everyone what was going on by the next morning our courtroom because this was during COVID mind you so the court case was the so the courtroom was over zoom the next morning they had like a hundred people waiting to join this zoom courtroom and this and at that point I had never like shared this story before, but it was really such a David versus Goliath or as Dr. Corn- Cornell West said in his interview, a Khadija versus Goliath moment, because by the end of that first day, I genuinely was m- emotionally and mentally preparing myself to get disqualified the next day. They had taken so many names off that I knew they only had like a certain number more that they needed to disqualify to bring it down below the minimum number of signatures that I needed and they still had so many more names to go through that I was like you know I had called my dad and was talking to my dad about it and just like basically like preparing myself for like the next time I'm gonna get I'm gonna get kicked out of my race you know and the next morning by the time we were logging in to the 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 day the court day on zoom there were like a hundred people in the waiting room ready to to be there and to bear witness to this egregiousness and they definitely got freaked out literally as soon as we opened up the zoom and i think the the lawyers and the challenger the other challenger were aware of this from that night i think they were probably like eyeing my social media and stuff because before it we even began with day two, they asked to convene with the judge and basically decided to withdraw their entire claim. They, they withdrew the entire case. And so I ended up winning and it was so crazy. It was so beyond my wildest imagination of what was going to happen that day. Like you'll never guess that your nemesis that's trying to take you down will just like surrender point blank, you know? Um, and so I ended up staying in the race and it was the first time ever that a muslim woman was on the ballot for federal office in new jersey's history and that just goes to show just how difficult how impossible the system makes it for for normal people as rania batrice gets into in our conversation for you for especially for minorities especially for young people first timers to even get into the race in the first place so to me that I kind of always kept that experience very, very, very close to my heart because it's like, it's one of those moments where you think like, okay, like this is it, you know, you know, it's not, you can't, you can't fight against this, right? Like the system is really hammering down on you and then you get this impossible win and Alhamdulillah, you know, like I seriously, like I definitely credit 
the support that I have from my community, from my followers on social media, from the people that have my back with every every move that I make, but especially to the prayers that I made that night, you know, um, and that night, like one of the people that I also spoke with was Linda Sarsour. You know, I called her at like midnight as soon as we got off of the, the Zoom on day one. And I was like, Linda, like this is what's happening, da, 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 you know, and she was like, yo, it's not over till it's over, you know, and just like getting those kinds of words of encouragement from the people that believe in you. It means so much. And I think that was always what inspired me to be that voice of encouragement for for others for people that i care about for people that i believe in for women that are younger than me that are trying to get into the career paths that they're seeking to make the change that they want to make I ended up like running the race it was brutal one other thing that happened was that the democratic party itself like the establishment was kind of like trying to pull out all of the stops to make it as difficult on me as possible, including putting me in ballot Siberia, which will explain what that is in the conversation with Rania. But um, long story short, basically the whole experience really, really opened my eyes to how much of our of our democratic rights are basically robbed of us by the way the system is set up. Another thing that I remember is that I wasn't even given access to the voter database. I ran as a Democrat. I've identified as a Democrat for most of my life, even though that doesn't at all um, line up with who I choose to vote for every race. But the Democratic Party itself, the establishment, was making it as hard as possible for me to even align myself with the party or to work through the party They denied me access to the voter registration records of the Democrats in the state, which should be available to every single candidate. But they apparently adopted a new rule prior to my race that they don't share the information with challengers of incumbents. So they basically are literally setting it up so that people don't get into politics so that they can hold on to the people that are in their seats and keep them there you know and the thing that's so bothersome about that is that especially when you think about congress you know our congressional representatives and this is why you should vote even if you don't you're not supportive of either candidates even if you're protesting you should still make sure to vote tomorrow because your state representatives, your local representatives, your district representatives are sometimes even more important to your lived experience than whoever the president is, you know? And like with congressional representatives, they have the shortest term out of anybody in office, right? It's only two years. And that's by design. Coming from a political science degree over here, the whole point of that is because congressional representatives are supposed to be the most directly connected to the people. And because of that, they should be constantly changing with the growing populace, right? Like there should be constantly changing every two years because the sentiment constantly changes every two years. These seats were never designed for tyranny. They aren't supposed to be lifetime freaking seats like the Supreme Court, okay? And so to see that we have career politicians that have held on to their seats for so long is more reason than ever for us to make sure that we are using our voice. And how do we make our voices count in this system? How do we play the system is by submitting our votes, by making them count, because the numbers matter. By the time you're listening to this, Muslim Girls endorsement will be out for the election. Um, (laughs) So... Go check that out on MuslimGirl.com. Um, I will say that I am, I, I can't, I can't hide my disappointment in the vice president. Um, I will say that we have been in touch with Vice President Harris's team for months, okay, for literal months, about having her address our community and inviting her to do an interview with Muslim Girl. And 
for months what we've been hearing back is we absolutely want to engage with you we want to make sure that she speaks with your community your community is important to us you know we felt like it was really important for vice president harris to engage with muslim and arab voters through connecting with women on women's issues right it's kind of like a no-brainer and so we really wanted to offer her the same platform that we've offered other presidential candidates and political leaders and you know just the way that we have been so consistent with our communication with them and we're kind of given the impression that she cares to speak with us and that never happening you know and towards the end like about a week ago the last communication that we received from her team was them offering to give us her Muslim outreach chair or one of her um, one of her surrogates, aka most likely an influencer. And we just felt like that was a bit disrespectful to our community, especially when other candidates like Jill Stein have taken the time out to actually sit with us and address our concerns and answer our questions directly. Um, for the vice president to not care enough to do the same I think has been disappointing for us. And, you know, as I speak right now, I don't know who won the election, but I really hope that that would not be an indicator of her commitment to representing the needs and interests of our communities if she does take on the Oval Office. That's all I'll say. The Democratic Party has to do better. It has to do better. So with that being said, I really wanted to just offer some context before we dive into this conversation with Rania. This conversation with Rania is only part one. There's a whole other conversation that needs to be had with Rania with you guys. We want you to hang around for that episode. But for this one, I'm so happy that I had the chance to decompress my first experience with public office with literally the woman that was my right hand during that entire experience and lived every step of it with me. And it is a great honor for me to introduce you all to Rania Batrice. Rania Batrice, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for We're having finally, me. We're finally like reunited in person. I know after a God lot of years. Yeah. A lot of years. Like it feels like a different lifetime. Actually, yeah, well, it's and it was like, through COVID years too. So it yeah. was like a whole nother, you know, lifetime. The last time that we connected, like really connected, was during the 2020 elections. Yeah, in New York. We were both in New York at the same time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And now we're here mm -hmm. at the 2024 elections. Things are quite different. Yes. And I kind of, I got really excited to run into you. We're at the ArabCon, the American Arab National Convention. We just ran into each other also at the Democratic National Convention as well. Yes, so. it's been like you know, fun surprises yeah. in really complicated <laughs> times. So very happy about it. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things that I have been getting asked about a lot and that I've been reassessing for myself has been the experience that I had running for Congress in 2020. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I literally lived through that with you at that time. Yeah. I don't think I ever really took the chance to reflect on that experience, mainly because I was so traumatized by it. Yeah. That it was like too painful to even like dissect or dive into. Yeah. But now, especially because I felt like that experience provided a lot of insights for this election cycle, mm -hmm. I've been looking back to it pretty frequently. And given that you were literally like my partner in crime at that time, I wanted the opportunity for us to decompress about it yeah. and like what you remember from it, yeah. because I haven't really been that open with my community about what yeah. that experience was like. So I kind of want to start off with who you are, because okay. you are just such a powerhouse. <laughs> oh, thank you. There's a reason why we were brought together and why you played such a huge role in my political career as young as it is. And also, you've just been, like, all over the place. You're, like, our Palestinian Olivia Pope. So, like... <laughs> I'm going to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you should, seriously. I'm yeah. going to make one for you. But tell us, like, who are you? What's the kind of work that you do? What brought you into this space? First generation Palestinian, of course, you know. And it's really kind of weird to have to say this. Like, it's gutting. It's been this many years. But it's been almost 25 years that I've worked really at the intersection of politics, 
and policy and advocacy and coalition building and and really all of my work and sometimes it seems disjointed i mean you know like i have my hands in climate and in reparations and in immigration and in healthcare justice and in all these different spaces and for me it's all come back to collective liberation i feel like i came to this work like i don't i don't even feel like i really had a choice just being palestinian mm-hmm. we wake up every day thinking about these things, even from a young age, even before we have the vocabulary for something like collective liberation totally. or understanding justice or, or sovereignty or any of those things, even before we have that vocabulary, mm-hmm. we grow up understanding that we're otherized. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. so it wasn't my intention to work in this space. That was not, you know, I had a whole life plan I was going to be a doctor because, of course, I was going to be a doctor. So my parents wanted blah, blah, blah. (laughs) But I think, you know, I got here because I had to. You know what I mean? This is what I I really feel like. It's really gutting and it's really exhausting. And it's so hard, as you know, Mm -hmm. to do this work day in and day out. But I think it's exactly what I'm supposed to be doing Mm -hmm. uh, just because of lived experiences and professional experiences and all the things. And, and even my, my, I love my parents so much, but my mom, you know, my, my sweet Philistine mom who immigrated here when she married my dad, when she was all of 18 years old, she was scared for me for so long and constantly like, you can't do this. You can't do this. Not because she didn't actually think I was capable of it. She was so afraid for me. She was so afraid Mm -hmm. of what was going to happen. And my dad yeah. is still convinced I'm going to be killed in the street any minute now. Oh, Cause no. like, you know, cause I'm Palestinian and yeah. I talk about it all the time. And the reality is, and as we speak, you're wearing an artist for ceasefire pen. Yes. And <laughs> you got to rep it. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's the, the, the reality is like, there have been consequences. I've lost clients because I'm Palestinian. I lost my mm. literary agent because I'm Palestinian. Wow. And, and especially before October 7th, but since October 7th, it's been much more blatant. Totally. And Have you lost political clients? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's gross and disgusting. And these are Democrats who operate under the progressive banner. So wow. let's be clear about sometimes we have to understand who people are. And yeah. this is... It's so and, and also the political spectrum that we're on, where yeah. like the most quote unquote liberal end of it is still yes. anti-Palestinian. Exactly. And when I lost one of my clients, I was actually visiting my parents mm-hmm. and I was really upset. Obviously, it's like always upsetting mm-hmm. no matter how much like, you know, you understand it's that person and not you mm-hmm. logically you still like in the moment you get upset. And I, I wasn't upset for too long, and I was kind of starting to get over it. And my mom, like, gets all emotional about it. And I was like, listen. Because she, she's protective. She is. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? They're showing me who they are. Yeah. I don't want to work with those yeah. people. Exactly. And it's not, again, I'm not saying it's easy. And I'm not saying it's not painful in, in, in moments and in times. But I mentioned all of that to say I've worked really, really, really hard to have autonomy, Mm. to be able to say what I want to say, to be the person that I am truly at my core. On your own terms. On my own terms. Regardless of the consequences. Exactly. And there, and again, I don't, I will never pretend like there's not consequences, Mm -hmm. but they still are, it's mine to take on. Mm -hmm. I get to decide. I get to choose how I come forward in society and the clients I take on and the ones that I don't and how I react, you know, to shitty people like the ones who (laughs) fired me for being Palestinian but it's also the thing I always say to my mom like you know y'all came here so I can make these decisions Mm -hmm. and I get to and that is it's a point of privilege yeah you know it always filled me with so much resentment when my parents would say stuff like that to me yeah like growing up my mom she never wanted me to wear like a kafia to school because she was worried I was going to get bullied more my my dad is like why do you have to bring up Palestine every single time? Yes. Like, just like oh exist God, in the yes. space. Like my parents, I'm sure yours were the same. They were yeah. desperate for us to assimilate. And survival. Yes. You know, it's out of fear. Yeah. All of it's out of fear. It's like yeah. the only way you're going to get ahead is by yeah. leaving behind the parts of you that make you who you are. Yes. That upset people. And the language. And although I will say my first language and my brother's too was Arabic. But as we got older and we were back in the U.S. And kids are jerks, you know. Mm. So like I, we have these two brown parents with heavy accents and 
all the things. And my brothers oh do much, look much more Palestinian than I do. They're darker complected. They've got the, you know, all mm-hmm. the things. But my brothers, because kids are such jerks and they were getting bullied too. I mean, I was as well, but they were like, please don't talk to us in Arabic anymore in front of, you know, when you come pick us up from school. I was like, please. I would yell at my parents across like the parking lot in Arabic just to be like, I'm not. I refuse. Even yeah. a, as a little kid. <laughs> I was this person, <laughs> even as a little kid. You're, you're like, painting everyone's side from like childhood. All the time. Yeah. Because, and I still, I have to tell you, my nephew, I have a sweet baby nephew who I'm obsessed with. And I only speak to him in Arabic. And I, I'm like, he will speak Arabic. And it's funny because my sister-in-law, who's half Palestinian, she doesn't speak any Arabic. And so when I'm talking to him, she'll kind of come up next to me and be like, what does that mean? Tell me what you, you know what I mean? So I'm like, that. I don't. You're, I mean, you're that is, cool auntie. Oh, it's I am like... number one auntie. I'm so <laughs> good at being an auntie. <laughs> like, I am the ultimate auntie for real. <laughs> but that cool. is, it's part of how we lose our indigeneity. You know what I mean? It's so how we, we lose our art, we lose our culture and our language and all these things. Because in order to be acceptable in a, quite frankly, like a white supremacist society... You have to shed all of these things. But do you think you. that's changing? Because it's it's kind of hot to be Palestinian right now. It is. <laughs> it definitely. We are in a moment for sure, and that's where I feel a lot of desperation of like we can't lose this moment. Mm. It's so. I mean, for the most devastating reasons that yeah. we're in, we were in this moment for it's the most horrific reasons and yeah. our failed policies and all the things. Mm-hmm. But we, yeah, but we are in this moment where it's like. It is cool to be Palestinian. And we, and honestly. Everyone's trying to say they're Palestinian. They're I like, know, I had a great, like, great, great grandmother. Like, <laughs> I'm like, so yesterday you wanted to kill me. Today, cool, cool. And we're all Palestinian. Yeah, yeah. yeah which I mean, listen, you know, everyone's like when, welcome. But. E- even when I was a kid, like really not too long ago, it was like I yeah. couldn't even say that I was Palestinian in oh, school. Yeah. It was like the equivalent of saying that you're a terrorist. Absolutely. Like, I did it anyway because, again, I'm a pain in everybody's ass. But, <laughs> but my parents would say, and again, I love my parents so much, and again, it was out of fear. Mm-hmm. They would say we were Israeli. I was like, the hell we are. Oh, wow. Even when I was little, I was like, yeah. no, no, yeah, we are not. Totally. Because, but again, it was out of fear, and it's exactly what you said. Like you say, you're Palestinian, you will immediately be labeled yeah. a terrorist. Yeah, yeah. and For it's sure. just like the absurdity of it. And this is where I'm like, we're taking it back in a lot of ways right now too. And but isn't that so crazy that our yeah. identity is so and, weaponized yeah. and not not controversial? What, what's the other? It word? has it's been like, controversial. Of I course, think, controversial. But, but I mean, like, it really it's jarring for people. Like oh, the yeah. reaction yes. of just saying that you're Palestinian, yeah. it's divisive almost. Yes, right. Just, just to exist just as to this. Ex- exactly. Exactly. That you're so a thousand percent correct. And I think that is a really hard thing to grapple with, especially again when we're in these supposed progressive spaces. And listen, there are some progressive spaces that like love them. They're mm-hmm. amazing. They're they're authentic. They're aligned. It's legit. And then there's the other progressive spaces that we've all heard the saying. It's like progressive, but for Palestine. Mm-hmm. And and the hypocrisy. And as I said, I mean, I work on reparatory justice in this country and other parts of the world. I work on Native American and indigenous issues around land back and things like that. And the same people, the same people that would call me and say, oh, how can I help with this reparations bill in Congress? How can I help with this land back effort? Are also the same people who want me to justify my existence and want me to justify the existence of my family. And I'm like, the hypocrisy is lost on them. You know what I mean? It's wild. And a lot of times people just want to feel like they're a good person by each quote unquote like their performative concern for Palestine you know no also true and this is I think where I do think it's important I am a I'm a believer that we have to continue nurturing and building this big coalition that's come together it's a must absolutely a must but like people's intentions need to be yes here you know that is and also like who are we platforming like that matters too 
Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to mess around with like a Candace Owen. I'm just, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Like, you know, but like, I, like, I'm not going to fight alside people that I love yeah. and, and who are sh- not just that I love and so I want to show up for and they're showing up for me mm-hmm. and then be like, oh, but let me, it's okay. Cause she said the right thing on Palestine. Yeah. I'm like, but then, and it's not just her, I'm not trying yeah, to spit yeah, on yeah, her, but sure. like any number of no, people. No, but I, I think a lot of people are like that from our community right now where it's yeah. like you could be the most, uh, you know, obtuse person, but yes. you say one thing that's yeah. like pro-Palestine. It's like, oh my God, no. Andrew Tate. The oh Andrew my Tate God. Yes. Like, <laughs> it's gross. Like, we'll overlook on. all these other things. Yes. Because you're, but I think it's, it's a testament to like how deprived we've been of yeah. allyship for no, so it's long. So tra- I, it's a trauma response, I think. It is. It's, it's a, a very trauma much a, and so I try I try it's to like approach we'll take it from them a place however we can of love. Get them. Yes. Yeah. Which I don't always succeed at, I will say. <laughs> but I do try to come at it from a place of love of like I understand where this is coming from. Like we have been deprived of it. it we there is like a desperation, but I'm also like, bro. <laughs> Wait, We've so got- on that no actually. Because it's kind of like this, the equivalent of being like a single issue voter, right? What's your take on being a quote unquote single issue voter as a lot of people that are concerned about the genocide in Palestine are being made out to be right now? Frankly, the first time I heard that, I got really angry because you're and and listen, like there are so many issues that I care deeply about. I mean, you know, like I am actively working on gun violence prevention in this country. Yeah, since I've like, known you. Every time I have to talk to a family whose child was murdered in their classroom, I I want to turn into a puddle. Like I can't, but I want to. I care deeply about the planet. I don't want kids, but I'm going to have nieces and nephews and I want to make sure they and every other child I care about and you care about has a planet to like survive and live on. Mm-hmm. I, I care deeply about these things. I care deeply about LGBTQ rights. I care about all, you know, and my, the reparations work specifically around black communities. I care so much about those things. Because they're all interconnected. Exactly. And I think that's where I get angry is where they, people try to make Palestine a single issue. I'm like, no, it's a climate issue. It's a girls and women issue. It's a disability rights issue. It's an LGBTQ rights issue. It's all, it touches all of these things. And you want to pretend like it's, separate and let me tell you it's not and not only that sorry you got me going now (laughs) but it's like not only that it is also that we and this is not new like let's be clear in this country like the military industrial complex has been alive and well for so long but the amount of money that is spent on dropping bombs on babies and committing and let's just just talk about this and like we're genocide. still dealing with student loans thousand percent we can't we can't afford health care yeah. yes we can't afford health care we can't pay for student loan debt we can't address climate change we can't do all we can't afford reparations we can't afford any of these things but we can find 20 billion dollars laying around to send <laughs> more weapons to israel cool cool like yeah. It's so gross and disingenuous. Yeah. And uh, so this is where, uh, back to your question. And, and also, like, it's, it's almost like a qualifier in a lot of sense, right? Yeah. It's like, what is the point of all of your other progressive values if yeah. you can find a way to justify genocide? Yeah. Or not yeah. do everything in your power to stop it. Exactly. You know? and not, that, not, that, yes. like, th- not that one issue is more important than the other, obviously, but it's like, isn't genocide like the, the final act? of the yeah. hatred like yeah. this is exactly what we aim to prevent by any means necessary right so it's like if you're okay with this yeah then by by default then that makes you okay with all of the the quote-unquote lesser steps it takes to even get there yes exactly and that's and it's the whole that whole idea that saying and i don't remember who first said it but was it Fanny lou hammer no somebody said and i'm sorry i'm not remembering but like your silence will not keep you safe mm-hmm. that's not how it works yeah. we've seen it over and over and over again you know and so okay. that's the if they come for one of us they come for all of us exactly exactly and this is also and i talked about you know existing in this white supremacist society and one of the things i talk a lot about is the and i talked about it yesterday actually too the cornerstone of white supremacy being division mm-hmm. dividing marginalized communities and communities of color on purpose because if we all actually came together and didn't see each other as competition but saw each other as true allies fighting Mm -hmm. for each other's 
liberation, mm -hmm. my God, can you imagine? There's nothing we couldn't do. Literally. Nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, and that terrifies them. Yeah. So, of course, they're going to put out this crap, like, separating us, separating totally. All the, the black trolls community online. from the Asian community, exactly. from the Palestinian community, from the, you know what I mean? It's like, that's also they, like, it's for the first time that so many of our communities are recognizing how intertwined their struggle is with Palestine. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, that is, it's the biggest threat in the world, I think. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Then I come along to Rania Batrice, 20 something Jersey girl. <laughs> Four months out from a primary <laughs> and decide to throw my hat in the ring to run for Congress against a 30 plus year incumbent who yeah. was holding on to his seat and still is holding on to his seat yeah. for longer than I've been alive Yeah, in a college town. And I mean, even the process of me getting on the ballot, I don't know if you remember, but yeah. it was like that alone was traumatizing. Well, you remember the ranking and stuff on the ballot and all like there were so many shenanigans that were happening. They're actually, I think Andy Kim is suing right oh, now for, really? for that tactic. That. Yeah. So in New Jersey, it's the only state in America where they are allowed to just arbitrarily decide where names are placed on the ballot. Yeah. And we have this concept called ballot Siberia, which is... If they want to predetermine who yes. wins, they will take the name of the person they want to lose and put them on like the farthest margin yeah. on the paper to kind yep. of like almost conceal them. Yeah. Which is what they did to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's really wild because you, you're like, you think you've seen it all. Like, you're like, oh, I know how they're going to suppress. I know but, how but they're going to. But it taught yeah. me so much, though, because yeah. there were studies that were done about this practice. Yeah. Like, the, I think it was, like, for a governor's race or something. And there was only one county in New Jersey where they didn't set up the ballot that way. And yeah. in every single county, that governor, because he was placed in, like, the very first column, he won, except for the one county where he wasn't. Yeah. And he lost in it. Yeah. So it just goes to show you. Like, it, yeah. it really opens your eyes to so many political tactics that exist that really predetermine the vote for us before we even yeah. cast a ballot, you know? and yeah. and. I mean, even just the process of me getting on the ballot in the first place, like I got taken to court, they yeah. tried to disqualify, they went one by one through the hundreds of signatures I got from college students and tried to find ways to disqualify them. Yeah. And all of them were students of color that they were trying to like. Which, I mean, again, the hypocrisy, you know what exactly. I mean? Like yeah. you're literally disenfranchising students and exactly. people of color. It's exactly. like. Exactly. But yeah. then I won the case. I won yeah. the battle and got my name on the ballot. First time that a Muslim woman got her name on the ballot for federal office in New Jersey's history, which yeah. is just a testament to how much we're up against in general for our yeah. disenfranchised communities, like you say. And the real fight began, right? And yeah. that's when we had to pull in the big guns. That's when I linked up with Rania. Yeah. And I don't know, like, how would you describe your role in my campaign at the time? Like, as my consultant, I, I considered you, like, my right hand, literally. Like, I yeah. I was in lock and step. Like, I don't think there was, like, a single move that I could make without, like, <laughs> consulting you, like, ten times on it at that time. I'm called a consultant or a strategist or whatever, but obviously. And I care. I always, listen, I've been wrong in my 25, almost 25 years of work. I have some people I worked with that I'm ashamed of working <laughs> with. But we've all got one of those. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> That'll be a different episode. <laughs> but but I really, it's one of sort of my core tenets and my core principles is I work with people that I love and I care about. And obviously you were that like times a thousand, just like our, we had a sisterhood immediately. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, consultant, strategist, whatever. But it was just like, you know, we talked 500 times a day yeah. and it was but I also think you know the thing I remember was when you got the when you got the death threat mm. do you remember yeah and it was like it was horrifying yeah and and it's not it wasn't the first time that it happened it wasn't or I'd seen it or been around it or whatever but it was just sort of like my god like we are with this is still happening like we are in we're still in this place. Like these are still things that we're having to contend yeah. with. And, and then on top of that, it yeah. is how impossible it, like ballot you access and there. all and then of those when you are, when you do get yeah. in there, um, like what else comes is like, just so you're like, Oh my God, like this is happening. Exactly. And yeah. One I'm, after another. For, for those that weren't familiar with the situation at that time, I basically got doxxed mid, yeah. mid campaign 
and somebody found like my family's home address my called me on my personal cell phone number which still to this day I have no idea like how and basically threatened to come kill my family and shove pig down their throats Mm -hmm. and they like repeated my home address to me and the FBI got involved. I literally had, like, an FBI officer, like, outside of the door of my home. And yeah. going to, like, my former addresses of where my family used to live to make sure those people were okay and, like, nothing was happening. And it was really scary. Like, especially as, you know, like, uh, being a young woman in your 20s, like, yeah. going up on a, on a platform like that and, like, putting in a fight like that. It's, uh, and, and also being so green. Yeah. I, I would not have expected really, like, what it took. Like, I feel like I kind of just, like, threw myself into, like, a boxing ring and got, like, beat the crap out of them, you know god i feel like that every day i get it <laughs> i'm like every day i'm like i'm done Fellas, i'm done <laughs> but what was your impression of that race because now looking back i'm just like oh girl like that was that was a really crazy well, i mean we thing didn't have I, I, if i'm being just really honest like we didn't have enough time like that's yeah. real like we, you know there's there's realities of campaigns which plug for campaign finance reform because the mm-hmm. amount of money it takes to run for office is absurd as mm-hmm. you know exactly and it keeps it keeps real people from running for office yeah. right because like you either have to be independently wealthy mm-hmm. or be attached to like bajillions of dollars yeah in order because you know you still have to you still have to survive yeah. during the whole thing exactly so it, i mean we don't have campaign finance reform yet we should but but that's not what we we're existing in and so for me, like, I wish we had more time, mm-hmm. obviously, yeah. and resources. And, and I also kind of felt like I wanted more people from the community to show up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. And that's, I still sort of feel that way now in, in, in a lot of ways. It's like we. It's, it's such a catch-22 because it's yeah. like people in the community don't want to risk putting something on the line to, like, get behind a candidate, for example. But it's, like, the only way that candidate stands a chance is if as many people get behind them as possible. Exactly. Exactly. No, that's exactly it. And and it's, you know, you're you're one example of that. And I think we've continued to see it. Um, But then I also feel like sometimes, like, within our community, there's also some, not all, who will throw money at any Arab or Muslim candidate yeah. like ever. And I'm like, okay, but that's also not the answer either. Right. We have to also be strategic. And you in particular had a really big opportunity. Again, like there were things that would have been great to have more time, mm-hmm. the, all, you know, more resources, all the mm-hmm. things, but like you have a platform. Mm-hmm. Most people come into campaigns, like a new candidate with zero platform. Yeah. No one knows who they are. They're having to sort of build up from from zero. And so, you know, I these are the kinds of moments where I'm like, my God, like, can we get it together? All right, everyone. I hope you liked part one of our conversation with Rania. Make sure you're sending in your mail-in ballots and you're making it to the polling places this week for the election. It's a very, very important one. And like I said, even if you're protesting, even if you feel like completely disengaged and like neither of the major candidates represents you, still make sure to make it out and get your vote in, you know, make your voice count. Just make them make them afraid of you. Okay, speak through your vote. It's literally the only thing that they care about. So make them mad. We'll be back with a special post-election episode. So we'll see you right back here. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review. It means a lot. Five stars is always nice. See you in the next episode.